Hello and welcome to Meet the Masters, um, Resolving Our Differences. Uh, we've got some great early career scientists here with us today and um, two featured masters, Dr. Anthony Gaston and Dr. Sarah Wanless. My name is Amanda Gladix and I'm a faculty research assistant at Oregon State University. Um, and I'm interested in sort of a variety of seabird topics, um, but most of my time right now is spent on seabird bycatch issues. And my co-host... It's me, uh, Schurer Hammer from University of Glasgow. Um, and yeah, what else is there to say? <laughs> Uh, I research Great School S um, and uh, pollutant uh, uh, pollutant analysis in that kind of area. Hi, I'm Nina Hanlon and I'm a third year um, PhD student at the University of Glasgow looking at sleepers as uh, monitors of coastal habitat, so specifically looking at spatial variation in herring gulls. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. I'm uh, Licia Calabrese and I'm a PhD student uh, at Paris University. I'm studying uh, the breeding biology and foraging ecology of the species of uh, shearwaters in the Seychelles or in the tropics. Good morning. My name is Nicholas Per Hufeld and I'm at Wake Forest University as a PhD student. I am working on Arctic seabirds and their behavioral ecology. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, I want to introduce um, the first of our two featured masters. I'm going to click over to his photo. So um, Dr. Anthony Gaston served for 35 years as a research scientist for Environment Canada at the National Wildlife Research Center in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. He is currently an adjunct professor at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario. He earned um, a BA in Physical Anthropology from University of Cambridge and a PhD in Zoology um, from University of Oxford. Uh, Dr. Gaston is the author of uh, four full-length books and more than 200 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, Dr. Gaston literally wrote the book on alcids. Um, which I'm hoping he'll sign for me at some point. <laughs> and um, in 2014, he was honored by the Pacific Seabird Group with a Lifetime Achievement Award for his contributions to the society and to our understanding of seabird ecology. Um, most of Dr. Gaston's seabird research has been in the Eastern Canadian Arctic and in Haida Gwaii, British Columbia where for the past three decades he has been developing long-term population studies of thick-billed murres and ancient murrelets. Um, these provide a detailed understanding of their demography. He is especially interested in birds as individuals. More recently, his research has concentrated on the effects of changing sea ice conditions on seabird ecology in the Arctic. So thank you very much, Dr. Gaston, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. And. Um Professor Sarah Wanless, she's a seabird ecologist and individual merit scientist at the Center of Ecology and Hydrology uh, at the Natural and Environmental Research Council in Penniquick, UK. She's over uh, 30 years of experience working in the North Atlantic and has published more than 200 papers with uh, over 5,000 citations. She's committed to communicating science to a wider, uh, wider audience, um, is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh an honorary professor at the University of Aberdeen, and in 2007 received the Zoological Society of London Marsh Award for Conservation Biology. And just days ago, she, she was awarded the very prestigious Goodman Salvin Medal for outstanding contribution to uh, ornithology by the British Ornithological Union. Um, much of her research has been focused on the long-term studies of demography, behavior, and diet of seabirds breeding at uh, the colony on the Isle of May at the entrance of Firth of Forth. Her uh, current research interests extend beyond the breeding season and use both traditional colour ringing and novel biologging approaches to track uh, individuals year round. Her research findings have had a great influence on conservation policy, uh, including a ban on sand eel fisheries in the Western North Sea following uh, a catastrophic seabird uh, breeding failures in Scotland. 
Great. So thank you so very much for being with us today, Professor Wanless. We really appreciate your time, too. So I want to pass it over now um, for our first question to Nina. Hi, yeah, I'll send this to Sarah first then. And my question was, what do you think the main trade-offs are by concentrating on the individual versus economy level or vice versa, and whether this might depend on different life history traits, so whether it's a specialist or a generalist or migratory versus resident species? Well, this is like a lot of the questions I think that we're going to be covering today. There's no, I think there's no simple answer is the bottom line because to some extent, it it, it it's like a lot of these things. It's going to depend, going to depend quite a lot on on what your questions are, what you need to answer at the end of the study, and also pragmatically, it, it sometimes also depends on you know where you are starting up a, a project so it might be that you're going to a, a an, an area for the first time and there you often are sort of you know very much sort of building up and and you've got a, le a, a lot less sort of options in terms of looking at some of these very detailed questions if you don't already have quite a, a lot known about uh, a, a, po a population so to some extent you know, it very much depends where you are on that overall sort of almost sort of research study continuum. So, I mean, I think the bottom line is you almost do need both because I think to really understand populations, you're going to have to, you know, understand individuals. And very often populations are going to, you know, differ a lot in terms of the amount of variation that you've got amongst uh, different categories of, of individuals and also if your environmental conditions are changing that also just you know adds to the the complexity so um, it, it, that hasn't really sort of answered your question I mean to some extent almost it I feel as though it, it, it is almost unanswerable in such a general context and actually to really sort of come up with a a, a useful uh, answer. You'd have we'd have to sort of focus it down and say, all right, well, this is this is the issue that we're really wanting to to get at. You know, these are the resources that we've got, and this is the time frame that we've sort of got to to to, to answer it in. So I'm very conscious that that doesn't answer your question. I mean, that no way reflects. It's not a very. It's it's a question that we all grapple with at the at the time. But I'm I'm just sort of. Just aware that it's it, it's sort of you, you know you're in a whole sort of almost sort of three-dimensional space with it, and the, and the right answer depends precisely where you are in in that whole um in in that in that whole context. So, I, I mean, I I think I would congratulate you on on identifying something which is is really important, but to some extent, coming up with the you know the correct answer will be very much context dependent and and what's right in one situation may well you know not be appropriate in another so I feel uh, I feel that's not very masterly but but it's as honest as I can sort of make it unless we sort of go into more sort of specifics Is that no, that's sort of Professor Gaston, do you have anything you want to add to that, or? Um, yes. Well, I'll I'll take the politician's approach, and I'll probably do this on all the questions. You know, I'll answer with the answer that I want to give rather than the answer to the question that's posed. Um, I think this is a a a subset of you know a much broader question in ecology, which is the question of the appropriate scale, and this enters into almost every ecological situation. I mean, you go out and you, you want to characterize the plants of the Alps, you know, so you, you walk a transect and you do a lot of one meter squares and you've sampled, you know, 0.0001% 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 of the habitat and how representative is that? Um, in the case of birds, I mean, luckily we know a lot about the behavior of birds and, and particularly individual birds because we've all got bird tables and um, and maybe a lot of people keep chickens and certainly if you keep chickens you know that you know birds have very strong individual personalities um, so and and I've certainly been aware of that with thick bill mers you know there's there's one bird that will let you do anything to it and and continue to 
stolidly brood its uh, chick or, or incubate its egg, and there's another bird that flies off as soon as your head sticks over the edge of the cliff. Uh, and clearly, in the case of that trait, um, there's going to be a, an actual fitness consequence to that behavior. So I think when you're approaching any kind of study, you, you've got to consider um, all levels of variation that you may be encountering and may be influencing the generality of your results. And so at the, at, the, at the smallest level that I've just mentioned, you know, there are individual birds. If you, if you make your sample too small, uh, it, it may be dominated by the behavior of a particular individual. And I think there's a famous case of this in the case of the behavior of the razorbill, which has been characterized as a lek species. And if you go to Scoma and you look at the, the famous rock where the lek was identified, you've only got to look down and you say, oh, yeah, well, that is what's going on. But then again... Do all razor bills do that? Well, I don't know. I don't work on them, but Sarah could probably <laughs> answer that. But I do think that it, it's a case of where, you know, there was there was something happening which perhaps wasn't general to the species, but did generate a lot of interest. Um, and so then, of course, there's the simple question of, you know, what's the age structure of the sample you're, you're looking at? And again, with seabirds, we know that in expanding colonies, at least there tend to be some areas which are dominated by young breeders and other areas which are dominated by... Um, uh, experienced breeders and that's going to have a big effect and now with all this GPS stuff you know now that we know where birds are flying off to to feed now it turns out that different parts of the colony may be going to completely different feeding areas and that may result in them feeding on completely different things so you know you've, you've got to think how representative is my sample in terms of age composition in terms of um, uh, you know, the, the actual situation, you know, it's a north-facing, it's a south-facing, all this kind of thing. Um, how does the actual uh, arrangement of the colony vary? And then, of course, there's the level between colony. But until you've really um, studied and understood the variation within colonies, there's not a lot of point in comparing colonies, because if you do that, you don't know whether it was just you know, the results you got were just because of the bits of the colonies that you chose. Of course, if, if you're fortunate to work on a very small colony where you can study all the birds, well, you can characterize that colony. But um, for the most part, seabirds breed in colonies that are much too big to do that. Sorry, I'm running on a bit, but you, you get the point. You've got, to, um, you've got to look at the scale which is appropriate to the problem that you're working on. But you, whatever scale you work on, you've got to be aware of all the different ways in which variation can occur. And my own feeling is that um, the current concentration on, you know, loggers and that kind of information is a, is a little bit dangerous in that it does tend to force students from that very vital experience of actually sitting watching what your birds are doing and understanding them as individuals. So I think it's really important to get that experience, even if your project is to do with, you know, when they're moving to the South Atlantic or something like that. It, it's really worthwhile knowing your birds as individuals, even if you're dealing with them at a totally different scale. Does that address your question? Yeah, no, that does make sense. And answers one of my other ones about the different structures and of the age and sex. So yeah, thank you. Great. So this is um, actually a little bit of a follow-up to that, um, to what you were just talking about, Professor Gaston. Um, and this is a question from Jana Jaglinski, who was not able to join us today. But um, she asked, um, when collecting data in large seabird colonies, how can we address and circumvent possible biases, biases in our data due to spatial clustering and sort of the limitations of our ability to capture and see birds that are not at the fringe of the colony. And I think this gets at kind of you, something you were already addressing, but if you can sort of talk about our inherent biases and in, in what we can sample um, and how you, how you have overcome those challenges, um, I'll throw it to Professor Gaston first. Yes, well, in fact, my last answer was probably more appropriate for this question than it was for the first question. Um, yeah, it's very difficult, especially if the colony is situated on a cliff or something that makes it very difficult to access central parts of the colony. And that has been a problem that I've been confronted by 
um, in practically all my work on thick build moors, uh, especially at Prince Leopold Island where the cliffs are so unstable that it's, it's dangerous to do any significant climbing on them. Um, yes, very, uh, it's very hard to know what to do about that and I think that the main thing is that you always have to bear in mind that what you're seeing at the edges of the colony may not be characteristic of what's going on in the centre. At the same time, uh, you know, many of the seabird colonies that we work on, certainly Sarah and myself anyway, you know, have a very long history and um, if you know that an area has been occupied for several decades, well it's probably a reasonable bet that that area is, um, you know, has a fairly diverse age structure. Um, if you're, if you come to a colony for the first time, and the only bit you can get at is on the margins, and you don't even know whether it's increasing or decreasing in size, then you really are a bit stuck if you just sample birds at the margins. If it's an expanding colony, then you may be largely sampling um, inexperienced birds. So you really have to be wary of that kind of situation and uh, simply um, you know, design your, um, your research and, and in particular uh, constrain um, the kind of deductions you make on the basis of your data um, based on the fact that you know you may in fact be dealing with a rather biased sample of the birds at that particular location. Professor Wanlis, do you have anything to add to that? Dealing with biases? Well I mean I think Tony's actually uh, really sort of summed up a lot of the key points. I, I mean I think the, the reality is that a lot of the time we're all very aware of those potential biases. But I mean, pragmatically, uh, I mean, as he says, when you're confronted with a, you, you know, many, a very sort of high cliff covered in very dense uh, breeding birds, I mean, you just simply can't get into the center to, to, to sample those areas. If you did, you'd either you know, cause massive disturbance to the birds, or probably kill yourself. So I mean, you you know, I mean, it's 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 just it, we, much as we would like to do it at the moment, we haven't got the techniques that we can do it. I mean, the, the if one had huge amounts of money, and there are just the very few places where you can sort of see this being done, you can create sort of artificial conditions. So you could you could say if you had a huge amount of money, you could build some sort of a tower down a cliff which would then allow you to access birds at, at different levels. And I mean, that would be absolutely wonderful. But the, 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 the bottom line is that would cost, well, it would be a not trivial thing to do. It would cost an awful lot of money. And so the thing is that for the majority of, of us, when we do the work we're going to, we're just not going to have access to those sorts of resources or those sorts of uh, uh, infrastructures. So I think we've just got to be pragmatic um, and try and do use some of the tricks that, that Tony's just alluded to in terms of, y y you know, sampling areas that we know have been occupied for a, a, a long time. And if we can, if you do know a, a colony very well, sometimes that familiarity, you'll suddenly find an area that you think, hmm, yes, that, that actually we can sort of get a bit further in than we could if we're, you know, we're just arriving for the first time. So I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of some circumstances that will just mean that we simply, you know, cannot, with the group of um, species that we work on, this is just something that we just physically, you know, can't achieve. But on the other hand, by dint of, you know, f very skilled field craft and, and being very good at, at field work, we can perhaps sort of, you know, offset some of those, those biases. And I think just going back to what Tony said at, at the end of the previous question, sitting and watching and thinking about a colony and how one can come up perhaps with sort of new techniques or new catching methods and everything. these are all things that I think you know it, it, it benefits us to do to really understand our, our study species and to think of new tricks that we might be able to employ in order to you know catch birds or or do some of these more invasive things without causing disturbance. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Nicholas next for the next question. All right, so I'm going to go a little more species specific for the, this next question. And something that I've noticed in some of my research, and I, I believe others have also published on this as well, but thick-billed mers 
And potentially also common MERS have a sex-segregated brooding and incubating attendance during the breeding season. And so this might, this will go to Dr. Gaston first. But what do you think the ultimate cause is, and do you believe this behavior is flexible? Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> yeah, this is a question very dear to my heart. Well, it is flexible because, um, at least in thick bill MERS in the eastern Canadian Arctic, the majority of colonies... Um, the, bird, the, the males are, are at the colony in the middle of the day and you go catching at midday and you, you'll catch you know, 95% males uh, and the other way around at midnight. But on the other hand, at Gannett Islands off Labrador, where there's a smallish colony of thick bill mers, um, it's the reverse. So, uh, and, the in, uh, and the interesting thing there is that the, the diet is completely different. Um, at the at most of the Arctic colonies where I've looked at this, um, the birds are feeding on schooling fish, um, either Arctic cod or capelin. Um, but at, at Gannet Islands, the, the situation is very interesting because there are a lot more common mers than there are thick billed mers, and uh, the common mers are feeding on capelin, but the thick billed mers are feeding on daubed shannies, which are benthic. Um, and, and so they've reversed. Anyway, I, uh, because my name is on the paper as a co-author, I, I have to mention a paper by Kyle Elliott um, where he, um, he suggested that, uh, you know, the sort of root of this was to do with um, males uh, feeding on the sort of organisms that they were going to continue to feed on during the post-departure period when the chick uh, is at sea and being fed by the male parent and that the females would therefore target, um, well maybe not as a cause of, but anyway but, uh, the females would be free to target other organisms and certainly we do see that di dichotomy at Coates Island um, which is why Kyle suggested the, uh, the, the hypothesis. Um, now how that fits in with the scenario at Gannett Islands, no one's sort of made the the critical observations to um, to know about that, but I, it seems to me that that's that's a possibility that um, the male is going to have to forage for the chick post departure. So consequently, the male concentrates on the kind of foraging tactics that it will be using while it's feeding that chick, um, and that may well be fairly short dives fairly near the surface because if it goes down for three or four minutes you know a lot could happen to the chick while, while the adult's gone and as the chicks get larger they dive with the parent although they, they still expect to be fed when they come back up and of course we don't know whether they're uh, you know actually feeding on things themselves um, if the chick actually accompanies the adult you know and it's half grown well it's obviously not going to be able to dive as deeply so so it's possible that, that foraging constraints are at the base of this dichotomy. I think I think that's a reasonable um, hypothesis. Proven? Well, definitely not. Um, you know, there's lots of room for further research on this topic, but that's, that's what I have to say on that. <laughs> Thank you for that response. And Dr. Wanless, do you have... Uh, any indication that common MERS have uh, similar behavior? Yes, I mean, we, I mean, we we found uh, again similar things uh, on the Isle of May in the, in the context of females feeding the chick more uh, during the day. Um, I mean, what we haven't ever gone on and done, and would be a nice thing to do, and I don't know whether or not uh, I regret to say I should have looked at Tony's paper before the uh, meeting today, but, but just trying to look at, at whether or not there are fitness consequences in terms of how well, um, you know, a, a pair might um, use this sort of uh, sex segregation of the strategy. So whether or not um, pairs where there was very sort of inflexible, well, where the female was, say, feeding during the day, whether or not they tended to uh, breed earlier, breed more successfully, have higher uh, chicks with, with higher uh, fledging masses, or indeed whether or not there were any differences in survival rates. So, I mean, I think, I think this is a really interesting 
area to pursue. And, and what I really like about it more generally is, is actually Tony was, was talking about, well, being interested in the individual. But I would say it's actually nice to take that a step further and, and be also be interested in the partner. So again, looking at, 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 at different pairs, looking at the sort of two individuals and, and differences and whether or not one sees uh, differences in terms of you know, timing of breeding or breeding success that might be associated with, with those sort of different combinations. So the only two examples that, that I could just quickly think of when, when I just looked at this was there's a similar paper, there is a paper on common MERS um, by the Norwegians from Hornoya where they in fact were looking at bridled and unbridled uh, pairs and found a, a difference in terms of um, I think the chick growth rates in different sort of combinations of pairs. So heavier chicks by pairs where there was a bridled and unbridled bird. And again, more recently, something that in fact isn't published, but but again, sort of considers the, the you know the um, the importance of of, of the, the two pairs. For our, for us, some work we're doing at the moment on European shags, where you look at whether or not a bird is resident over winter or moves or is or migrates, then whether or not you've got pairs which are um, resident resident or uh, migrant, migrant or uh, resident migrant, that in fact has a, a, a bearing on timing of breeding and that in turn has a, a, a bearing on, on breeding success. So, I mean, I, I, to a certain extent, I mean, I, I think some of these, I think this might be something that we could very much sort of benefit by looking a, a lot more about because I think it could explain quite a bit in terms of breeding success or, 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 or breeding performance. So I, I think it's a lovely idea and, and one that, um, it, yeah, I think could be, we could see a, an awful lot of research and, and papers coming out of it over the coming years. Thank you. I mean, I, I agree. I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic that has a lot of opportunities. Yeah, it really suggests that we should be keeping track of both partners instead of just putting tracking devices on one of the pair. Um, yeah, thank you. So I think we're going to pass it over to Licia for our next question. And I think our um, scale of thought here is going to be broader. So Licia, do you want to ask one of your questions? Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, my questions are quite broad, in fact, and uh, as I'm uh, more interested uh, uh, in uh, the um, well, marine ecosystem in general and in general the impact of uh, human activities on seabirds, I would like to, to uh, have your opinion, uh, for example, uh, at, at which point do you think uh, the scientific community uh, is uh, in uh, assessing the impact of fisheries on seabirds? And uh, like uh, in many places, uh, an impact seems to be found. Uh, will the economic uh, interests be stronger than ecosystem ones? So is there any hope uh, to to um, kind of, uh, if we find a big impact of fishery, for example, uh, can we do something about it or no? <laughs> Maybe we can ask yeah, that. I, it's a, yeah, it's a question for, for both. So Maybe doc, Dr. Wanless, do you want to take that on first? Um, well, it, I, I mean, I think start by saying this is really one of these huge uh, questions. So I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think this afternoon we can quite sort of uh, uh, provide all the answers. We could probably, uh, we could probably have every single um, of, of these meet the master sessions just dealing with this one question. But I mean, the bottom line is it's a really important question, and it's one probably that. You know, if we're seabird biologists and we're working on applied uh, issues, and particularly within ecosystems, it is one that we constantly ask, and it's one that we, you know, should be able to try and address. The reality is that um, to do this sort of thing really effectively, 
I think probably needs more than just working on, on seabirds because it does broaden out. It does say, okay, you do need to, the, to then be collaborating and integrating with people working on, on other uh, aspects of, of, of the ecosystem. And, and that in itself, I mean, th that's a very nice thing to be able to do, but it also presents challenges because it often means that you've got to be involved in quite a big program of work with, 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 big, with big funding. So, to some extent, my guess is that pragmatically, uh, you know, a lot of the time we can't do as, as much on this effectively because we just don't necessarily work within the right sort of research projects. Just, and, and, and also really just knowing just exactly how ecosystems are operating and, and what the consequences of, of changing you know, management of one aspect of the system will be on the rest of the system, particularly when other things are changing. Getting that right is is a huge challenge. So the area I, I know most about is the, the North Sea. When we started, I mean, the, the, the North Sea is very much thought of, of being a, um, a system where one species uh, lesser sand eels is crucial for that sort of mid-trophic forage fish. And what we had seen was initially there had been a lot of uh, huge uh, fishing of some of the large commercial uh, uh, species. Those had been overfished, uh, so stocks were very low. And what then happened was that fishing was then directed lower down the, the food chain, hitting the forage fish. So in that situation, what we then saw was that, yes, there were impacts on, certainly impacts on some of the birds. That evidence, those facts, then were then used to then implement some um, fishing management, so some bans from certain areas where uh, sand eels couldn't be fished. And that hopefully has, uh, I think, benefited at least some of the birds. However, what, what's then gone on to do, we've then gone on to do is, is then think of more ecosystem-based approach to fisheries management, which in theory sounds really good, but in actual fact what's happening is that, that we are being successful with that, so some of those fish stocks are recovering. And what may happen in the, in the future is that we're going to be in the situation where those fish stocks have recovered, they probably take a larger proportion, they will then take a larger proportion of some of those forage fish and that in turn may then have a negative impact on some of the seabirds. So to some extent you, you then have these management, management for, to improve the state of our fish stocks could have perhaps sort of slightly unintended consequences, unexpected consequences, and, and although we would then have what we would say, a, you know, a more sustainable fisheries, that could be at the expense of some of our seabirds. So I think it's when, you know, we, we, we need as ecologists to understand the systems, and then when you then link that to, you know, sustainable management of marine ecosystems, I think the other thing that when you sort of get in that real world that, that Tony was talking about, about, you know, politicians, policy, well, you've also mentioned economics. It, it actually, you, you know, where you, end, where you end up is is not easy, is not easy. So we as, 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 as ecologists, I hope we can say something about what we think ecological consequences are. But when you add that to that political, that economic and that social mix that's a pretty that's a pretty powerful cocktail so and I'm just describing that in 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 one in one situation and you can then sort of take that across the globe and every I think every sort of situation is different so it, it, it is a challenge there's I think there's no quick fix but I think it's one we have to be sort of you know the better the information we've got the more sure we are of facts or uncertainties we can then, I think, contribute to that debate in a meaningful way. But we have to then understand that when it gets into that sort of political arena, there are other sort of things that are important in addition to to just e e ecological ones. So that probably hasn't told you anything you didn't know already. But um, 
I, I think that's sort of where we are. Yes, no, yes, thanks. It's, it's very complex and as I'm working like in the tropics, the situation are very different than uh, like uh, the lower latitude, uh, higher latitude. So yeah, I, I agree that, uh, well, what I think is, uh, yeah, more we know is and better it is, as long as we can kind of um, focus on things that are really uh, the key of uh, what's happening. Just try to identify the priorities and then go and based on that. Thank you. Professor Gaston, do you have anything you want to contribute to on this topic? Uh, yes, uh, I could say something. I, I mean, it turns out that most of my studies have gone on in places where fisheries aren't an issue. Um, there's no commercial fishery where I work in the Canadian Arctic, and in Haida Gwaii there's longline fisheries, but they seem to have relatively little impact on the marine birds, so it's not one that I've got um, much experience of, but I, I, I think it's part of a more general question about, um, you know, shifting uh, shifting the balance of power within different trophic levels in marine ecosystems it is a really fascinating one and um, you know one of the things that's happening just around my place where I do a lot of work in Haida Gwaii uh, which is like on Hecate Strait which divides Haida Gwaii from the mainland of British Columbia and now 30 years ago um, yeah, it was a great day if you saw a humpback whale. Oh, look, there's a humpback whale. Let's go and you know chase it and try and photograph its tail and all that. Well, um, in recent years, you can't get out of the harbour because of the humpback whales jammed in the entrance. Um, there are hundreds of humpback whales, and, and they're feeding like crazy. And I'm looking at this, I'm thinking these gigantic animals are feeding practically 24 hours a day um, taking great gulps of exactly the sort of fish that seabirds like to feed on, or in some cases swarms of euphausids, which we also have lots of seabird species that feed on. And this has to be rearranging resources for the local marine birds. Now, you know, I haven't, I haven't seen any evidence of what it's doing, but it has to be doing something. I can't believe that you can move in hundreds of gig giant um, sort of meso predators in terms of their diet and not have an impact on on the ecosystem and the, and the other thing is uh, I think there's a general rule in marine biology that people will look down the food chain but they won't look up and that's because for a long time we were sort of operating on the idea that well predators didn't really have much impact on anything um, so everybody sort of thought well there's um, you know there's production and then production feeds into the, the, the next trophic level, the copepods or whatever, and, and it kind of builds from there. But people who studied copepods never bothered to look at the amphipods or the euphausids, and people who studied amphipods and euphausids never bothered to look at the fish. And of course, people who studied fish never bothered to look at the seabirds and marine mammals. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's beginning to change. I mean, we're, we're gradually, as we begin to see predators coming back, top predators, things like wolves in, in terrestrial ecosystems and, and uh, well, I just mentioned whales in marine ecosystems. And also we're, we're getting to see, maybe look at those few little remnant ecosystems where sharks still dominate uh, their predatory level. I mean, the actual biomass distribution at the different trophic levels is, can be enormously different from what we thought was the, quotes natural situation. So, um, as, as Sarah said, this is a giant topic, but it, it's also, to my way of thinking, one where, where we're beginning to um, be in a position to address it properly, because I think up to this point, we weren't really focusing on the right things. Um, we, we didn't appreciate the extent to which ecosystems can be structured by top predators. Now, what the role of seabirds is relative to other things, of course, I don't know, and there's a, there's a fair amount of evidence out there that they're relatively minor compared to marine mammals. But still, um, 
these are certainly things worth thinking about, and I think this is a really exciting area for, I mean, given that we now have, you know, these huge modeling tools and so on, this is a really exciting area for future research in understanding you know, why marine ecosystems are structured in the way that they are. Great, that's a lot to think about, but yeah, I think a really exciting area to start thinking really broadly and bringing in perspectives of that are the birds that we're interested in as individuals are not the only part of the ecosystem that we need to be paying attention to. Um, so I, oh, Licia, sorry, someone else have something to add? So it was. It was just. I just was coming in, just adding a, a, what, what sort of Tony had, had said, but yes, I, I mean, again, this is quite, there's almost a sort of cultural um, issue here, because to some extent within the marine uh, community, marine ecosystems community, it's actually been quite hard for seabird biologists to be taken seriously. So we're seen as people that just work on sort of fluffy birds you, and, and then we're not proper marine ecologists. So I mean I think I think there is an opportunity here and very much an opportunity for early career researchers because I think seabird ecologists are now being seen and taken more seriously the sort of things that we're doing. We're getting more respect from, from marine ecologists. But when we talk about ecosystems, one of the difficulties of, of bringing in the predators and bringing in the seabird predators, which links into some of the other things we have been talking about, is the challenge of doing that effectively within uh, sort of ecosystems and looking at energy transfer, because the, the, the species that we work on are so mobile. And in terms of a challenge to really do good sort of ecosystem work, that mobility is is a is a real challenge. So I I think you know I think this is a super a super issue, and it'll be one that you know if you're having something well if we're having something like this in sort of 10 20 years time, this topic will still be be there. It, you know it's it's a really big one. Sorry, I should have <laughs> need to move on, but it, it, yeah, sorry. No, that's great. Thank you for for that. I think we've got a question from our online audience. Um, Shu, do you want to ask that? Yes. Uh, so we got a question from Saskia Wisniewski. Uh, she doesn't. Uh, she doesn't post it to any particular person. Uh, do long-term study sites potentially bias our knowledge about a species? And how important is adding new study sites for species? Uh, does, do, do, do either one of you? Want to tackle that one? Well, I certainly think it's a very relevant question to both yeah. of us. Because we we both you, you know a lot of our research has been on on long term studies. So I mean, we should both say something. Shall I bash off? Please do. Um, I mean, again, I mean, I, I think long-term studies within the, the context of, of seabird research and what we know about, well, demography, diet, behavior, a whole lot of things, without long-term studies, we certainly wouldn't be in the strong position that we're in now. I think a lot of the time we are very conscious that, that generalizing from, from one area, even over quite small distances, can be quite risky. Um, and I think where this has been done, it, it is showing that, that the, there are important, there are important uh, differences. So I, I think what we need to try and do is, is keep some of those long-term studies going. But if we can start up new studies in, in other areas, at least to then sort of actually sort of map what those sort of um, where we see over, over, over which um, areas, regions, we're seeing similarities. I think knowing where those boundaries are at the moment is very helpful. The, 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 the reality is it, it's, it's the resource issue, it's the, the time issue, is how do you, you know, how do you get the extra funding, the extra resources in order to do that. So in short, I mean, I think we would all love to see that, that, that is really what we should be trying to do. But it's just trying to actually usually raise the resources in, in order to, to make that happen. 
Yes. Yeah, I can I can add a bit on this one. Um, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, Long-term studies, uh, especially um, those that are run by people who do a lot of publishing, um, do certainly bias the literature uh, towards events that may be peculiar to a particular site. So I, I'm not particularly getting at you, Sarah. This applies to me just as much as you. But um, I, I, I think we've always got to be aware of that. I think, I think the other thing, though, is you know th this can be particularly exaggerated if you start your long-term study in a site which is rather odd. And the, the, the classic example of this was John Coulson's magnificent Kittywake study in North Shields, where he studied kittiwakes nesting on a warehouse on window ledges. Well, this had tremendous advantages for accessing the birds, but on the other hand, it wasn't exactly a typical kittiwake colony. And moreover, it was constrained to a particular number of breeding pairs by the number of window ledges. So, you know, right off the bat, you had a, a, a totally sort of weird situation in which these birds were being studied. And so I, I think if you contrast that with um, you know, somebody who's studying, um, uh, you know, common mers on Bear Island or some some huge colony like that. I mean, I mean, okay, there may be uh, um, particular things which are characteristic of Bionoia, which are not uh, characteristic of other common mer colonies, but at least what you're seeing is characteristic of a of a big chunk of population. Um, and so I think. I think we have to we have to look at um, the situation, and often, you know, there are logistic advantages. And clearly, in, in Coulson's case, it, it was magnificent. You know, he had hardly any distance to travel, and absolutely no hazard in driving his car, um, and um, and he was able to get at the birds really easily. And so we learnt an enormous amount about them, um, which we could never have learnt um, in those days by any other means. Um, the study is a real landmark, but on the other hand, as a you know natural history of, of the black leg kittiwake, as we call it in North America, um, you know it has definite drawbacks. And I think if you're looking to characterise a species, you probably don't want to do it on the basis of a study and a, and a really weird place or, or of any very small marginal colony. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, lots, lots to think about. Uh, also, in relation to how how new emerging colonies uh, um, so may may change as they as they come to age. Um, Amanda, did you have any new questions? Yeah. So I think we're gonna we want to spend at least a little bit of time talking about. Um, how you guys got to where you are and um, what advice you have for early career scientists. So I'm going to pass it over to Nicholas. All right. So this question is for, for both of you, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Gaston, and then we'll go to Dr. Wayne Wanless. So to get to where you are today, what has been the most difficult obstacle you've overcome? Well, sorry, did we get this one in advance? I don't remember this one. Um, I don't. I don't remember any particular obstacles. Um, staying alive has always been a little bit of a challenge. Um, I've I've come close to killing myself on numerous occasions, but aside from that, um, I don't. I don't really remember any any huge obstacles. Um, I started bird watching, you know, at the age of ten, and I started banding at the age of twelve, or ringing as it's known elsewhere. Um, and uh, you know, I never really thought about doing anything else, um, at least as a as a major interest, anyway. But it never occurred to me I'd be able to make a living out of it. I mean, all that's come up since. Um, so I, I, I think I, I mentioned to Amanda in some correspondence that basically my strategy has been to be lucky, and I can recommend that to anyone. <laughs> so just just to maybe refocus that question a little bit, is so is there a, a specific event that you can think of that changed your career path that 
that may have been due to luck? Well, yes. Mr. Gaddafi coming to power in Libya was the event that sort of changed things for me because I was, I was working for Yale University as a fossil collector in Libya and when Gaddafi came to power we got thrown out and as a result I still had a, a, a leftover from another project. I had an air ticket to India so I went to India and, um, and got married and, and saw jungle babblers and realized that these were really interesting birds to study and so on. So yeah, in fact, thanks to Mr. Gaddafi who, who met a rather, a rather horrible end not long ago, um, not that it wasn't well deserved probably, um, but that was, that was probably a, a defining point. Thank you. Dr. Wanless? Well, that's a very difficult act to follow. So, uh, um, <laughs> if, if, I, if I'm actually thinking about one event that actually, um, you know, really did, really did sort of put me on the track to where I am now, it was actually when I was an undergraduate at Aberdeen University, and we in those days had tutorials so it was just a, a, a couple of us and one of the, the university lecturers and they would give us a paper or something to uh, read uh, before we had our sort of tu tutorial. And Nelson was a lecturer at Aberdeen University and he gave us one of his papers on, on gannets, on gannet behaviour to read and in the course of that, so I, I enjoyed reading that and we had a great discussion. I, I, I really enjoyed the discussion. But he also at that point mentioned that there'd been a newly colonized gannetry down on the Yorkshire coast, which was close to where I lived. And at that stage, we had to be thinking about what our honours projects were going to be on. And I, that made me think, and I thought, oh, I wonder if I could do my honours project on that gannetry down uh, on the Yorkshire coast. So I went along and said, oh, do you know, do, do, could I do that? Brown Nelson said, well, I think that might be quite interesting, off you go. Off I went, and actually from that moment on, I, I was absolutely hooked. I mean, I just, Tony sort of talking about enjoying sitting, watching birds, seeing things happen. I spent most of my summer back sitting at Bempton, watching gannets, recording all sorts of data, including some actually some very interesting things, thinking about, because that stage it, you, all you could do was look at things in the colony. Already at that stage I was thinking, oh, I'd really love to know where these birds go when they aren't in the colony. But I, I, I think it was, it was undoubtedly doing that honours project and getting absolutely gripped with with field work, wanting to see what my observations told me about the sort of behaviour of these birds and how things were changing, and uh, and I mean I think I, I it, that was a defining moment for me, and and I sort of decided this is this is huge fun if I can somehow manage to persuade somebody to pay me to do this in all sorts of different places or on all sorts of different things, I'm going to give this a go. So I'm not sure how much of an obstacle it was. I, I mean, the obstacle was just, I think, probably being quite flexible and trying to sort of see, well, if, you know, if, if something comes up, mm, why not take it wherever it is, whatever it's on, try and use the experience and, and sort of build up uh, knowledge. So, uh, so I don't think anything was very well planned, but I just sort of thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try anything. Thank you. It's always fun to hear everybody's journey and if there is one specific event that changed the direction. Yeah, so we, we just have just a few minutes left and I want to pull in um, another question from Jana. Um, and I'm wondering if each of you can give one key piece of advice um, for early career researchers or early career scientists um, to have a successful career in science, what would you tell them? Let's uh, let's send it over to Dr. Gaston first. Well, the piece of advice, which is fairly obvious, um, and this applies not just to uh, ornithology or, or even to science, but just to research in general, unless you're really, really interested 
in getting answers to the questions you're asking, it's pointless. And it's much better to go out and, you know, become an investment banker or something, make a lot of money and buy up Amazon rainforest to conserve it. Um, I think you really got to be in love with what you do and, and what Sarah was just saying about falling in love with Gannett, not a bird I would probably fall in love with, but <laughs> it's um you know that that that's you've got to have that kind of attitude, otherwise the whole thing doesn't make sense. It's a real grind writing science, and um, you've really got to want to get the answers in order to get there. Thank you. Dr. Wanless? Well, I, I mean, I can only really endorse what, what Tony's said. I, I just think, yes, he's absolutely right. Uh, it's, don't, you can't think of it as a, a nine to five uh, job, as a career. You're going to have to work, you know, getting up early, this, so, and, and that's got to be a pleasure, not a, a chore. But I think you know the the the, the real thing also it, it is it is a tough it is a tough world one is uh, very often judged on results so as much as possible the you know the advice is also don't just sit on your results publish them because they in some ways they have to they have to get out there you you've got to communicate what you've done I mean conventionally through scientific papers but you, you know obviously also as, as in, in the case of Tony writing, you know, books and everything. So, so communicating is also very important, I think. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for, um, for your thoughts. And, and thanks especially to Dr. Gaston and Dr. Wanless for contributing all of your expertise and your advice. And um, I think this was a really interesting discussion and thanks also to our early career scientists who put the time in to think of, of very insightful questions so thanks for for all of your contributions. Um, thanks also to our people who are out there watching um, live. We have 12 viewers right now which is great um, and we hope that others will get a chance to watch the archive video of this. We've got another Meet the Masters session coming up on May 15th um, with Akinori Takahashi and Steve Vodier. So we hope that um, folks will join us for that as well. And we're going to go offline now, but we can continue the discussion in the comments section for this broadcast on YouTube um, or on our Google Plus page. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>